Welcome to the Known Victory Church YouTube channel. We are so glad that you found us today. We exist to make Jesus known and to be a place that anyone can call home. If you haven't yet, make sure to subscribe, like, and share these messages so we can truly make Jesus known in our homes, cities, and across the world. We pray that this message impacts you and helps you to grow closer to Jesus. But we're going to be uh, continuing in our series today. We're almost done. Uh, we're going through the questions that God asks us. Some of the questions throughout Scripture that God asks of people and asks of you and asks of me. And I want to encourage you to, you know, spend some time, you know, on your own going through these questions in your own space because most of these questions are a call for us to reflect and a call for us to grow and a call for us to go deeper and a call for us to to, to grow stronger and be more courageous. And and it's been an amazing, amazing series. But I want to do the, the, the next part of this series, and it's going to come in John chapter 5, verse 1 to 3. And so if you have your Bibles, you can go with me there to John chapter 5, verse 1. And it says this, Afterward, Jesus returned to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish holy days. Inside the city near the Sheep Gate, there was a pool of uh, Bethesda with five covered porches, crowds of sick people, blind, lame, and paralyzed, lay on the porches. So this, this is the scene. Jesus shows up to this location that is known for healing people. This, no, this Bethesda, this pool that was known to have healing power. And Jesus sets himself up, shows up this day. Now, if we can imagine this in our own common context, it would kind of be like a hospital that has no rooms and no doctors and no nurses. They all just show up. Oh, we don't have the slides. I'm going to... I'm going to get the, them the slide so that it makes it easier to follow along today. So please forgive me. Um, we've had a, a little bit of a crazy morning. So give me like, say hi to your neighbor or like, you know, like this is like the intermission. Like what's that song, the intermission song? I don't know what it is. Yeah, like elevator music. Yeah, like you know what I'm talking about. Um, so yeah, just give me a minute here. I apologize. It's kind of awkward, and I love it. You know, as a, as a speaker, this is like your most like, this is what you don't want to have happen, right? Those awkward, you know, one of the biggest fears of people is, is public speaking, and then when, when things don't go right, it's even uh, crazier. So almost ready. Did we get it? Got it? I think we got it. Anyway, let's go, let's go back. Jesus is on the scene, right? Uh, he shows up to, the, to this area, the pool of Bethesda. And this is, again, an area that is known for healing. And, and so Jesus shows up. Again, it's kind of like a hospital. If, they, if the hospital had no, uh, no doctors and no nurses, no rooms, it just kind of was this open area, this pool, that supposedly had these healing powers, had this miraculous healing pl- uh, powers, a gathering place for the sick, all types of ailments, and again, crowds would gather to be there and be a part of it. And there's a few uh, theories as to why people thought this pool had power. There's a few theories. The first theory is that uh, an angel came from heaven and touched the pool and brought it healing powers. And this idea comes from scripture. And it's, uh, it's John chapter five, verse four, which says, for an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first after the troubling of the water stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease they had. Now, this verse, this John chapter 5, verse 4 verse, isn't in the earliest manuscripts, manuscripts of the Bible. And so people who have this belief, they would add this verse in, or they would say it was a part of the original manuscripts. But it's not in the earliest manuscripts that we have today. The second theory suggests that healing took place in the waters of Bethesda because the, fo- the, the pool was fed by, min- by a mineral hot spring. 
people uh, who think of this viewpoint believe that the naturally occurring, occurring sulfur, calcium, potassium, magnesium, zinc, phosphate, and nitrogen in the spring would have spontaneously cured some of the ailments and some of the diseases as they went into this water. Now, there's other people who believe that, 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 that this pool of Bethesda was established by the Roman Empire for the express purpose of honoring their healing God. And so many pagan structures at this time were built in the area during the Roman occupation of Jerusalem, including an arena, an amphitheater, and various bathhouses. So these are some of the theories, but this, this water at the time, no matter the reason, was known for being a place where healing would take place. People would travel from afar to try and get to this water to try and find healing for their bodies. All, all different kinds of ailments, right? The lame and the blind and the paralyzed would come and try and get the water to get healed. And if we go to verse five, it says this, one of the men lying there had been sick for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him and he knew he had been ill for a long time, he asked him this question, would you like to get well? This is an interesting question to ask somebody who's sick, especially somebody who's been sick for a long time. Do you want to get well? Would you like to get well? That's an interesting question. I think if I was in an environment where, where I was in the doctor's office and he gave me the condition, he said, would you like to get well? I think most of us, the answer would be absolutely I would. I think 99% of the time, the answer is yes, I would like to get well. But what I love about this story is Jesus meets this man in the crowd. And what I want to encourage us with today, with this idea that Jesus found him in the crowd, is that Jesus will find us in the crowd. Jesus notices us, even in the middle, if we're in the middle of chaos, even if we're in the middle of a big crowd, Jesus still sees our face. He still knows who we are. I think I've maybe shared this story before, but there was one time, Beth and I, we were, we were flying back from Phoenix, Arizona, and while we were flying back, uh, we, we, we tried to be as cheap as possible. You ever book a vacation as cheap as you can? And then when you're on the vacation in the travel days, you're like, I really wish we didn't do this. This is exactly what happened. We booked on two different airlines with different types of points to try and get good flights. And so what I did as the good husband and the good man that I am, guess what I did? I gave Beth the best flight. Her flight was, was through Seattle and back home quick. It was quick. It was like, I think it was like six hours. My flight, I, I, I flew to San Francisco two hours after Beth uh, took off. And then I had a five-hour layover in San Francisco. And then I flew home. And so I had to get to the airport. I think it was four hours before my flight because we all went together. And so I get to the airport four hours before my flight. And then I get on my flight to San Francisco. It was a maybe, you know, three-hour flight two-hour flight, and then I have a five-hour layover in San Francisco, and then I finally go home. My travel day was like, was like 16, 17 hours for a flight that literally direct is like maybe four. And so I, I remember sitting in the San Francisco airport, and I was having a bad attitude. Y'all ever have a bad attitude, even if it's bad attitude, even if it's your own fault? I was having this bad attitude. I'm like, Beth is a lucky girl. I'm the, I'm the best husband, but I'm miserable in this area. But I was tired. I was bored. And I remember sitting in the middle of a crowd, right? You've been in an airport. There's people everywhere. And I remember feeling so alone. I remember feeling so desperately alone. And, and it was actually kind of in my mind. I was like, God, like, like, even like, why do I feel so alone even though I'm in the crowd? I think sometimes we feel like we get so caught up in the crowd, we get so caught up in the noise, we get so caught up sometimes even in our own family that we, we think that we don't matter. Imagine this guy, he's 38 years sick. And all of a sudden one day someone comes up to him and says, hey, would you like to get well? I want to encourage you that Jesus will see you in the crowd. Jesus will see you in the crowd, even if it's a crowd of all the same people who are struggling with the same things as you, they're having all these diseases. He will see you in the crowd and he notices you. And I think Jesus might be asking us this question today, would you like to get well? That even if we feel insignificant, he knows your story. He knows your name. He knows your pain. He sees you. He doesn't just tolerate us, he sees us. He notices us. 
would you like to get well? It's an interesting question. 38 years this man was waiting. 38 years of waiting for healing to come and it never did. 38 years to wait is a long time. Some of us in this room are not even 38 years old yet. Some of us, we might not even be halfway to 38 years old yet. Some of us were double 38 years old. We've got an amazing group of people here in this room. But 38 years being sick. I think one of the hardest things to do when we're sick, whether that's physically or mentally or spiritually or emotionally, you know what one of the hardest things to do is trust that God will heal us and then sit back and wait. You know, one of the hardest things to do is, is we believe that God will heal us, but sometimes we have to sit back and wait. Sometimes the waiting for the healing is the hardest part. 38 years. The question, what may be for us today, is what do I need healing in this morning? What do I need right now? Maybe God is asking you this question, would you like to get well? Because I think that this question is an invitation for our desperate need for Jesus. That nothing else the world has to offer us will bring us the love and joy and peace that we need and the healing that we desperately need, nothing other than Jesus. See, we can look in all the areas and God can use uh, creation, God can use doctors, God can use all of it to bring healing, but the deep healing we need in our lives Nothing else can offer except for Jesus. We need him. We need him to get better. We need him. But the funny thing about this guy is he doesn't answer the question. If you know the story, we'll go into it. The, the question was, would you like to get well? And he doesn't answer by saying yes or I wish. He immediately says this. He says, I can't. He says, I can't, sir. For I have no one to put me in the pool when the water bubbles up. Someone else always gets there ahead of me. I can't. Ever feel this way in your own life? Maybe you're eyeing for a promotion or you're trying to get something or you're trying to, you know, you're saving up for the, for the guitar or you're saving up, you're trying to get the car, or you're trying to get the house and then everyone else around you seems to get it before you. Ever on social media and you're like, man, I want to get married so bad and then all of a sudden all your friends from high school are getting engaged and having babies and you're like, what about me? Not me, I got married when I was 20, all right? I, I, I was one of the first. If we ever have this moment where everyone else is getting what we want and everyone else is getting what we need and this guy says, I can't because no one's gonna help me. No one's gonna help me get into the water. Every time I try, someone beats me. Someone's better than me. Someone's stronger than me. Someone's more courageous than me. Someone's more creative. Someone's more gifted than me. And every single time I try, it feels like I can't make it because someone else gets there in front of me. He basically is saying to Jesus, I can't do it by myself. I need help. I want to go through some of the hardest things for us to say as as people. And I want you to say these with me. The first one's going to come up here is this. uh, The next one, I'm sorry. Can you say that? I'm sorry. One of the hardest things for us to say as people, right? I'm sorry. And number two is this, I need help. Can you say that with me? I need help. What about the next one? Try and say this. <laughs> Everyone always says it different and they're like, that's how you say it. I don't know how to say it. I'm not even gonna try. <laughs> Some of the hardest things for us to say is I need help. I'm sorry. And that type of sauce. But these are the things that I think ail a lot of us is the ability to say, I'm sorry, and the ability to say, I need help. This man gets to the pool 38 years. Jesus says, would you like to get well? He doesn't say yes. He says, I can't. I can't. I don't know how long he sat by the pool waiting. I don't, we don't know how long. We just know he was sick for a long time, and I'm sure he tried many ways to get healing, and he tried many opportunities. I think he got to a point in his life where his desperation stopped, and he just b- believed, this is my life now. I gotta deal with this the rest of my life. And he says, I can't. I can't do it. And the reality is, is we can't do it on our own. We can't find the healing we need on our own. Whatever it is, mental, physical, spiritual, emotional, we can't find the healing on our own. Why? Because we need Jesus. 
We need Jesus. See, the pool was there the whole time. He could have asked someone to help him get in the pool. Maybe he did. The pool was there the whole time. This, this opportunity for healing was right in front of him, but he kept missing the boat. I want to encourage you that whatever you're struggling with, learn to ask for help. And I mean ask for help spiritually. Go to God and say, God, I need help. But go to our church and say, I need help. I'm struggling. I need prayer. I need you to pray for me because I got this diagnosis. Or I need you to pray for me because of this addiction in my life. I need you to pray for me. We need to ask for help. And we need to answer the question honestly. What do I need help in? You know, we might have similar excuses to this story. I can't. I'm not capable. I've tried. It's too late for me. I used to want to get healed, but nothing seems to work. I feel like this is just a part of my story now. I keep going back to this addiction. I I thought I beat it, but I haven't. The diagnosis from the doctor keeps coming back worse and worse. I keep trying to overcome depression, but... It always seems to find me again. I keep trying to overcome anxiety, but I lay at night worried about tomorrow and I I lay at night, I can't sleep and I'm struggling. I think this is some of our story. But I think this is the start of the realization that we need Jesus, that we need his help. We need his guidance. We need his power. We need his courage. We need his love. We need his joy. We need his wisdom. We need Jesus, and we can't do it on our own. We need him, and we need to be desperate for him. And then he gives the action step, right? Verse eight, Jesus told him, stand up, pick up your mat and walk. What a request. Stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. 38 years of being unable Guy comes and says, would you like to get healed? And you're like, I can't. He's like, watch this, stand up, pick up your mat and walk. And then verse nine, it says this, instantly, the man was healed. He rolled up his sleeping mat and began walking. But this miracle happened on the Sabbath. This is the miracle. The healing took place. It didn't take place in the pool. It took place in the conversation. It's an interesting way to heal somebody. Right? Jesus didn't touch him. Jesus didn't pray for him. Jesus didn't just didn't rub mud in his eyes. Right? All he said was, he didn't do anything. All he said was, get up and you're good. Get up, pick up your mat and walk. It's an odd request. But I think sometimes when we're in the process of healing, Jesus may ask us to do something. See, often the miracles Jesus performed in the Bible required an action step, a step of faith. When Jesus had to feed the 5,000, he said, you feed them, right? And they come back with a few little bit of food. They're like, this is all we got, Jesus. ain't gonna work. But they had to take an action step. This moment, the action step was get up, pick up your mat, and walk. Pick up your mat and walk. An interesting call of action to take the thing that used to be you're fully reliant on for comfort in the, in the midst of all your troubles, the mat and pick it up. The thing that used to not be in your control now is in your control. You can carry the thing that once carried you. See, everyone is celebrating in this moment, right? A man's healed like we do. When we see healing, when we see a miracle, we like to celebrate. It's a, wonder, it's a beautiful testimony, right? A testimony of God's goodness and greatness. However, if you know the story, not everyone was excited about this miracle as this man was. In fact, some people were very upset about this miracle. Not because of the healing, but because of how it happened. And in verse 10 says this, so the Jewish leaders objected. They said to the man who was cured, you can't work on the Sabbath. The law doesn't allow you to carry that sleeping mat. That's their first response. It's not, congratulations, you're walking? 38 years, look at you. I'm proud of you. It's, this is wrong. What just took place today at the healing pools is wrong. This is not how the miracle is supposed to happen. You're supposed to get into the water and come out healed. This is not what you're supposed to do. Ever get a good gift? 
or get something amazing. And this is exactly the response from the people around you. They don't even believe you did it right. You cheated. That was supposed to be for me. Right? You ever have these moments where you get something. The way you got it is wrong. You know, this healing took place and how it took place in this moment was illegal. Because he carried the mat. Illegal on the Sabbath. You're not allowed to carry the mat on the Sabbath. And in Mosaic law, what was the punishment for breaking the Sabbath? Do you know what it was? It was the death penalty. For, for working on the Sabbath, it was severe. The death penalty. So this man, Jesus says, pick up your man and walk. He starts walking. And all of a sudden, he's, they're like, this is wrong. You're, you, you might have to die today. Essentially. This, this, this law was that you weren't supposed to work on the sa- Sabbath. Whether it was the death penalty or not, the, the punishment was very severe for what Jesus asked this man to do. It's very interesting, though, why did Jesus ask him to pick up the mat? I think it's a great question. Why? Because it's, it's, not, it's not a good idea. See, the healing came in the wrong way. It was illegal what he did. So why tell him to pick up the mat? I think this is because God's heart behind rest on the Sabbath had been changed. The original intent, the original idea of rest had been changed over time. It almost felt like the Jewish leaders, what they do is they started to worship the law rather than worship God. Their focus was how do we make this law, make sure that we all follow it word by word, which of course was good, but they had taken it to almost another level. They'd become so obsessed with the law that they had forgot about the heart of the law. Jesus came and didn't abolish the law. He fulfilled it. And Jesus says, pick up your mat. He's saying, man, you guys have missed the point. You missed the point. The Sabbath isn't about holding people back. It's about allowing people to find the rest that they desperately need. And of course, this man, he's under this interrogation. And the man responds how I think many of us other, uh, many of us would, verse 11. But he replied, the man who healed me, he said, pick up your man and walk. It's his fault, not mine. I'm just doing what he told me to do. He healed me. I'm picking up my mat and walking because that's what he told me to do. And I'm walking now. Look at me. It's not congratulations on your healing, not wow. It's this is wrong. How dare you? Pick up your mat and walk on the Sabbath. This is bad news. This is not good. How dare you get healed on this day? Who told you this was okay? And he goes, the guy who healed me said, it's fine. He said, pick up my mat and walk. Here I am picking up my mat and I'm walking. They're almost telling him, hey, let's put that mat back down and get back on it. That's where you belong. According to the law, you belong on the mat, on the ground, because what you're doing right now is not okay. You know, I think what this looks like in our life when we're looking for healing and when we're struggling and we start to see the light and we start to see hope and we start to see joy, you know what's gonna happen? There's gonna be people who come and doubt it. There's gonna be people who come in and say, no, it's not gonna work. You gotta try this method or this is not the right way. It's gotta be this way. But we gotta listen to what God tells us to do even if it doesn't make sense. So many times throughout scripture when people got healed, they were asked to do kind of odd things. But it's the obedience that I think oftentimes brings the miracle in our life is listening to what God is saying. We have to hold fast to what God has spoken that even when everyone else might be telling us to do it different, so everyone else might be telling us to rethink it, we say, no, I'm trusting what God has spoken and I'm gonna live it out. And we're gonna start to see the miracles in our life. And verse 12 said said this, who said such a thing as that? They demanded. The man didn't know. For Jesus had disappeared into the crowd. But afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and told him, now that you are well, so stop sinning. Or something even worse may happen to you. It was a bold thing for Jesus to say. I think what Jesus was trying to highlight to this man, and I think maybe what he's trying to highlight to us today 
is that our physical healing isn't as important as our spiritual destiny. I think some of us were so focused on being healed physically, which is good. Let's, you know, God can heal us. But what's more important is where we go when life ends. You know, bodies can be healed, absolutely. It's incredible, but it's all temporary. Even physical healing doesn't last forever, right? Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead and then Lazarus isn't still here with us today. He died again, tough, right? Died twice, that guy. But it's all temporary. Why? Because our spiritual outcome is more important. And Jesus said, right, he said this in this verse, now that you are well, stop sinning or something even worse may happen to you. He's, what he's saying is that what you've experienced these past 38 years is nothing compared what could be. It could be way worse. Why? We got to stop sinning and start pursuing Jesus. What's more important is our spiritual destiny than our physical healing. Yes, God can heal us physically, but it should all lead us to draw closer to him and lead us away from a life of sin. Our spiritual lives are forever. Now that you are well, stop sinning. Why? Because the wages of sin is death. See, death is inevitable. But what comes after death is not. We have to commit our lives to Jesus. He may heal us, which is so amazing when God heals us. But he's drawing us and leading us closer to heaven. And we have to follow him there. The question we have to all ask ourselves today, more important, is how is my spiritual life doing right now? How do I, how am I connected to Jesus? You know, this whole summer, we've really been talking just about connecting to Jesus. Why? Because most of these questions that are asked are conversations to draw us close to him, to help us realize our desperate need for him. See, when Jesus enters the conversation, when God enters the conversation and starts asking us questions, we got to learn how to listen and learn how to respond. Because it's not like just me asking the question. God is asking us this question. And why does it matter? Because our spiritual life and our spiritual health is very important. If we want to be well, would you like to be well? We have to take care of ourselves physically and mentally and emotionally and spiritually. So I think for a lot of us, we're good in some areas. Maybe our physical health is good. You know, we like to go outside. We like to exercise. We go to the gym or we play sports. But when we look at our mental health, we're really struggling. Or maybe we got our mental health all figured out, but when it comes to our spiritual life, we're really struggling. We haven't read the Bible. We haven't prayed in a long time. We gotta take care of our entire well-being. How are you doing when it comes to your mental health? How are you doing when it comes to your physical health? How are you doing when it comes to your spiritual health? Not just the typical answer, I'm fine, you know. I'll come home from work one day and be like, how are you? I'm like, I'm fine. I'm good even though there's something that went on or something tough. I'm like, I'm good. Don't worry about it. That's what we tend to do as people. We like to just tell everyone, yeah, we're good. Everything's fine. I'm not struggling. My marriage is good. I'm not struggling. I'm, I'm doing well. My mental health is awesome. When in reality, there's deep struggles we're all facing. How are you really doing? And then in verse 15, says this, then the man went and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who healed him. So the Jewish leaders began harassing Jesus for breaking the Sabbath rules, but they replied, but Jesus replied, my father is always working, and so am I. There's an interesting answer to the question. These, these, these Pharisees, these Jewish leaders, they are not happy. They're, they're, in fact, they're very angry that this man was healed on this day. Not because of the healing, because they didn't care about the healing. All they cared about was that he picked up his mat. That was what was important to them. And I think we have to, as followers of Jesus, not, not get so caught up that we forget that people matter. That you matter and your family matters. That your friends matter, that your kids matter. We can sometimes get so caught up in trying to live a perfect life, which is impossible that we forget to love those around us while we go. We forget to love those around us. Jesus shows up to this pool and he calls one person out. 
And he meets them where they are and he heals them where they are. And he calls them to more, to prove it, to courage. It was Jesus. See, this is our testimony. We might not understand why or even how, but Jesus has healed us and brought us out of so much darkness. I think if we all look back in our own story and our own testimony of what God has done, we can see how far we've come. You know, maybe back then we were the ones sitting on the, by the pool on the mat, not sure where to go, not sure what was next, and we're struggling, and Jesus calls us out. It's our testimony. He's the one. He can handle the pressure. See, Jesus was, was a, is a part of the story. And he came to fulfill the story, to finish the story. See, Jesus didn't even pick up the mat. He didn't touch him. He didn't pray for him. He just said, pick up your mat, take a step of faith, and go. See, this question, would you like to get well, is a question that has to get us thinking and has to get our minds to Jesus. Rather than our minds on our ailment or rather than our minds being on our, on our struggles, what if our minds were on Jesus? It says, do you want to get well? I think some of us for the answer is yes, I want to. I want to get healed, but I can't. I can't. I've tried. My mental health is poor. I've tried everything. I can't. Maybe some of us, we say, you want to get well? I've tried. I've tried. I go a few days without this addiction eating me up, but then I fall back into it. And then I go a few more days and I fall back into it. I'm struggling and saying, I've tried. time to rest in his presence i know again i know we've been talking about this all summer but it's because it's so important to learn how to rest the truth of the sabbath was rest and this is what this man needed he needed rest he needed peace he needed healing allow jesus to speak life over you and speak joy over you and speak love over you that's our takeaway today. Again, simple as always. <laughs> Would you like to get well? Do you want to get well? What it is, is it's an invitation to closeness with Jesus. An invitation to healing. An invitation to life. An invitation to everlasting life. And the abundant life that he promises this life with Jesus. Once we give him our life and we follow him you know, as followers of Jesus, it's not about, you know, our church attendance and, you know, where we go. It's, it's about who we follow. And we follow Jesus. That's who we follow. That's where we go. We follow him. If he says pick up our mat, we pick up our mat. Even if it doesn't make sense. Even if we know there's going to be people who are like, that's not it. Would you like to get well? to fix our eyes, not on our sickness or our disease, but fix our eyes on Jesus. He wants to bring us life. Would you like to get well as a call to closeness with him? And the closer we are to Jesus, I truly feel the more joyful we will be. Even if we don't feel joy, it's like, man, chaos surrounds me. Of the closer we are to Jesus, joy will come. I want to I wanna pray for us this morning. And, you know, one thing I want you to know, we as a church, we believe that God heals. We believe that God has healed. I've seen healing. Maybe you've experienced healing in your own life. God heals. But I also want you to know that our spiritual health is very important. And you may be very healthy physically, but you might not be very healthy spiritually, and that's a problem. We 
need to be healthy in our relationship with Jesus. Let me pray for us today. God, I thank you that you do heal us. God, I pray right now for our minds. I pray that you heal our minds in Jesus' name. God, I pray that you heal our bodies in Jesus' name, head to toe, miraculous healing in Jesus' name. And God, I pray for our spiritual healing as well. Any spiritual trauma, any spiritual darkness, God, I pray it's gone in Jesus' name. And God, I pray that we will draw close to you and that God will keep on knocking, will keep on seeking. And God, I thank you that we will find you. God, that you'll meet us where we are. In Jesus' name, God, I thank you that you call us out of the crowd. And God, more important than anything, God, I thank you that we will learn how to say we need help. God, we need you. We're lost without you. We're broken without you. We need you, Jesus, in every area of our life. We need you. And God, those of us who are saying, I can't today, God, I thank you that you can. God, I thank you that your strength and your love and your grace is sufficient for us. And that we will seek you in the midst of all the brokenness. And God, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen.